The Japanese invasion of the Philippines was conducted on schedule. The first landing was made on December 8th. And during the two weeks following, beachheads were successfully secured at six points in the archipelago. The Nipponese assault troops had been well prepared for this kind of campaign. On Luzon, the principal island, the strategy called for the forces which had landed at several points to drive toward Manila and seize that objective. The main strength in that push was provided by the assault group which invaded the island at Lingayan Gulf, 110 miles from Manila, across central Luzon. By Christmas, Japanese invasions had been made at nine points in the Philippines. And the campaign to seize control of this important strategic area was well underway. After a thorough softening up process, the invaders pressed onward toward Manila and what they hoped would be a quick victory on Luzon. During the first weeks of fighting on Luzon, the Japanese steadily reinforced their original assault units. As 1941 neared its end, the Japanese were succeeding in closing in on Manila from two directions. The Japanese plan for choking off the Philippine capital was working perfectly. Nipponese planes began bombing Manila in early December. The air attacks continued as the invading ground forces drew closer to the Philippine capital. The Japanese raids on U.S. airfields took a heavy toll of U.S. planes, many destroyed on the ground. At year's end, advanced Japanese units approached within sight of Manila, which was still bombed, though it had been declared an open city. In little more than three weeks, the spearhead of the Japanese ground offensive on the capital had driven within striking distance of the objective. Evacuated by its defenders, Manila was the invaders for the taking. The Philippine capital passed into the hands of the enemy on January 2nd, 1942. The Nipponese claimed they were liberating the island. But most Filipinos scarcely considered it liberation. Japanese propaganda units went into action at once, spreading the doctrine of Asia for the Asiatics. Are we not all of the Far East, they asked? The advantages of life in the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere were dinned into the consciousness of Filipinos of all ages. Some Filipinos helped the Japanese in their campaign. In Manila's streets, Filipino collaborationists spoke to their countrymen in Tagalog, a Philippine native tongue. The conquerors blamed the Philippines' troubles on the U.S. But their campaign was not an overwhelming success. Most Filipinos remained unconvinced. They remembered the story of Japanese rule in China and Manchuria. The greater East Asia propaganda continued throughout the occupation, but it needed strong backing. In mid-March, with the enemy in control of almost all of Busan, General Douglas MacArthur, the American commander, left the island on orders from Washington and assumed new duties in Australia. The general arrived on the down-under continent to take over the preparations for mounting an offensive against the enemy at the earliest opportunity. In Manila, the start of the Japanese occupation was celebrated by the invaders with a parade through the center of the city. The seizure of the Philippine capital gave the Nipponese more satisfaction than most of their other conquests. Most gratified of all was the Japanese commander, General Masahiro Hama to whom this day was one of the most memorable of his military career. General Huma would have found it hard to believe that this city, whose people regularly paid him deference on Japanese proclaimed holidays, would four years later be the setting for his execution for war crimes. But during early 1942, it was hard for the Filipinos to see beyond the Japanese occupation, to visualize their country again free from the yoke of the conquerors. Under Japanese rule, some Filipinos openly collaborated with the invaders. In late April 1942, Corregidor in Manila Bay was the last outpost to resist the Japanese invaders of Luzon. For almost a month, the Japanese bombarded the island fortress with every weapon at their command. 
on May 5th, 1942, Japanese assault units crossed the narrow channel separating Luzon from Corregidor and stormed the rock's dirty defenses. After nearly 24 hours, fighting on the island ceased on May 6th. Many British aircraft were destroyed on the ground early on, and the remainder withdrew to Singapore. This gave the Japanese air supremacy over Malaya, and they badly disrupted British communications. Japanese aircraft also attacked Singapore itself. German Alpine troops, with a short-term lease on a snow-covered mountain range in the Caucasus, install their guns on a peak overlooking a Russian emplacement. Grand scenery now happily rid of these unpleasant tenants, thanks to a particularly shrewd landlord, a man called Stalin. Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the little runt in the undertaker's clothing, introduces Rommel to journalists at a press conference in Berlin. The Nazi general has come to talk about events in the Middle East. This is a throwback to the days when Rommel was well planted in Libya. The hair doctor simply dripping with cordiality. So they all flapped their hands and the desert big shot went in to see Adolf What's-His-Name. They had been stationed there in case of trouble with the Japanese. Now these troops had been transported to relieve the embattled defenders of Stalingrad. <laughs> As the reserves entered the city, at headquarters, the commanders of three Russian armies were meeting. The Germans had fought for Stalingrad as a prize. The Russians were determined to make it a trap. Two simultaneous attacks were launched, one from the north, one from the south. The German armies encircling Stalingrad were now themselves threatened with encirclement. Finally, the two prongs met. These battle-hardened soldiers of the Northern Army and soldiers of the Southern were emotional as children as they greeted each other. They knew this meeting meant the salvation of Stalingrad and of their country. And on this Christmas of 1942, the people of the Soviet Union can celebrate with happy hearts. They have received a most precious gift from the men of their army the assurance of ultimate victory. Just as in our hometowns, it is the children's day in Moscow. It is a happier Christmas this year. Today, there are no German bombers overhead. celebrated on New Year's Eve, but not now. The factories are just as busy as on any other night. The moment comes. It is the New Year. Stop and go them. And at the front, the greeting is the same, up to a point. Stop and go them, again! Inside Stalingrad, the icy winter becomes a fiery hell. Here are concentrated the latest in Russian equipment. Flamethrowers. Ice gliders. Used here by shock troops to capture airfields in advance of the main army. Rocket guns. Katusha, the Russians call them. 
Every last resource of the Red Army was thrown into a crushing offense of ultimate destruction. and Kessel with a vengeance, but the Nazis were getting Kesseled instead of the Russians. And on February the 2nd, 1943, after 162 days of the heaviest fighting in the history of warfare, the last shot was fired. Peace came to Stalingrad. In the shattered streets, the blasted ruins, the ghastly evidence of their ordeal, the defenders of the city greet the rescuing army of the dawn. Stalingrad is free. The Nazis had capitulated. German generals who had been ordered by Hitler to take Stalingrad regardless of the cost, and who had obediently promised that the city would be his. These generals, 24 of them, who had covered themselves with such glory and such medals on the fields of Poland and Norway and France, they now had only their past glory to comfort them. This is Field Marshal von Paulus, Commander-in-Chief of the German armies at Stalingrad. This is the man who told his soldiers that if they surrendered, he would see to it that their families died in reprisal. When he faced his captors, perhaps his worried expression reflected an anxiety that Hitler might take the same revenge on his family. For he knew that when he surrendered, Hitler lost not only a field marshal, he lost an entire army. 22 divisions, 330,000 men. These are the men who had been promised that as conquerors they would winter in Stalingrad. Well, it was winter, and this was Stalingrad. <laughs> 